Thank you very much, Ian. Hello, my name is Nicholas Bernhard, and I am the developer of Nantucket eBooks, A Better Way to Write and Read Online. And I'm very excited uh, to be here today. This is my first time at Libre Planet. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about why I made the Nantucket eBook platform, why I felt it was important that the platform be ethical, which involved making Nantucket eBooks a free software project. I'm going to talk about what was involved in getting there. Now, uh, my work on Nantucket eBooks includes the eBooks themselves, uh, the shanty markup language that I use to write my eBooks, uh, and the software that parses that into the eBooks. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on the eBooks themselves, although all the software I write for the platform uses a free software license. Now, I'm sure everyone here is uh, familiar with uh, what we mean when we talk about free, but for anyone who isn't familiar with it, when I say free in this talk, I mean free in the sense of freedom, uh, respecting the freedom of the authors and readers who use Nantucket eBooks. When you hear me say free, think of free speech and not free beer. Now, I am a writer, first and foremost, and in large part, Nantucket eBooks was born out of my frustration with the proprietary applications that most eBooks require to write and to read. I had written a historical novel called November in America, and for the eBook edition, I decided to use Amazon's Kindle Direct Publishing platform. And I found the process of making an eBook with KDP very frustrating, and I wasn't really happy with the end result. I decided that for my next written work, I would create the kind of ebook that I would want to read and have the features that I wanted. First thing that I knew I wanted was a browser based ebook. I think most people already do most of their computer work in a browser uh, email, video, messaging, and even productivity software like spreadsheets and word processing. I should be able to read an ebook in the browser too without needing any special apps or devices. Now, there are HTML based ebooks such as Project Gutenberg, and sometimes people just put PDFs of books on their site for people to download. Now, the problem that I found with Gutenberg or PDFs is that it really doesn't work for people on mobile. If you look at Gutenberg ebooks on a phone, you get this very tiny text on a very harsh white background. And it's the same with the PDF. You're always pinching and zooming and scrolling to get the text that you need to read. So I thought that a good ebook that's web based should include things like viewport tags and the HTML, CSS media queries so that'll look good on any device the reader uses, a phone tablet, a laptop, or a desktop. Instead of a harsh white background, use a lower contrast like a sepia or seashell. And finally, I think it should include options like dark mode and resizable text to improve the readability further. And I'll just give you an example here of one of my Nantucket eBooks. So here it is on a desktop. This is for The Monk by Matthew Lewis. And so this is how it would appear on desktop. Uh, on desktop, the menu for the interactive features would be in the top left corner here. You can see it makes itself scarce when you're not needing it. And then it shows up when you do need it. And it drops down and has all the icons on the left-hand side. If I was on a phone over here, uh, you'd see that the uh, menu icon goes to the bottom. And then it lays out the icons in this grid format here. Going back to desktop, all the text, I wanted to resize it. Um, if I'm reading at night, I could click this uh, light bulb here. That's going to turn it into dark mode, a little easier reading in the low light situations. And then I can push these buttons to resize the text, and that uh, information is all getting saved to local storage, so it'll be resized the way I need it next time I reload the page. So I think those are all things uh, that are good for improving the readability of eBooks. The third thing, so that was the second thing, mobile responsiveness. 
Now, the third thing I knew I wanted was built-in audiobooks. I believe that audiobooks are one of the easiest ways people can improve their quality of life and a great way for people to get into reading. I wanted an ebook that would let me re listen to the audiobook edition without having to go to a separate app. I'll show an example of that. Here's the ebook for Silas Marner. And then if I open up the menu over here, I've got the cassette icon here. And if I click that, that opens up the audiobook player. And I can mute things, I can scrub a forward and backward a minute or 15 seconds. If I had multiple chapters, I could open up a menu here. So I think that's uh, oh, it's something I always wanted. So you could have access the audiobooks from within the ebook itself. Uh, now at this point, uh, the next thing I did was write a markup language that would make the writing of the ebooks easier. And there's a little bit of a backstory to this. So I went to college for film studies. And the first thing you learn about screenplays uh, is that they have, the first thing you learn about screenplays is they have a very rigid format. And if you're a beginning screenwriter, one of the fastest ways to get rejected in Hollywood is to deviate from that format. Uh, a huge amount of time is spent learning the format and people will spend hundreds of dollars on applications like Final Draft to adhere to the screenplay format. Now, around the time I graduated from college, two guys named John August and Stu Mashwitz came up with a markup language called Fountain. And the idea with Fountain was that you write your screenplay in this, much, in this markup language that's a lot easier to learn and write with. And then the, a program formats that markup language into the screenplay format for you. And as a film student, I can't tell you how much easier it was to write in the markup language. It actually made screenwriting fun because you, for once you didn't have to think about margins and tabs and inches and fonts. The program took care of all of that. All you had to do was write. So anyway, cut to many years later, and I was thinking of Fountain as I was writing my eBooks in raw HTML, moving around big chunks of code. And I realized that I could write my eBooks in a markup simpler markup language, and then a script would parse that markup into HTML for me. And that became the Shanty markup language. Uh, so as I started writing Shanty, I also wrote a script that would parse it into the HTML and a manual to document all the syntax of the markup language. And then I thought it would probably be a good idea if the parser had a graphical interface. That way people could be writing their markup on one side and then they could format it out into the ebook on the other side. You could see them next to each other. This interface I called Arrowhead after the house in Massachusetts where Herman Melville wrote Moby Dick. So uh, let me actually show you an example of that here. So here is Arrowhead. This is the graphical interface that I described. So uh, to start writing in Shanty, uh, you need a title, and that's two exclamation points. And then title. And then I'll just say this is a test. And if I want to be in, add the author, two ex exclamation points, an author. And then I'll add, have to add a keyword that helps catalog the books. So test. Chapter headings start with a pound sign, somewhere to mark down. So chapter one. And then for a paragraph, I just write, this is a paragraph. And up here, I've got this button that says run. If I click that, it formats it. So you can see the title on the left here becomes the title over here, the author, and then a keyword. Um, and so the chapter formatted into the chapter. Let's say I wanted to make something italic. Just uh, nest, some, I just nest the word in asterisks. So I click here, so now it's italicized. I want to make it bold. I nest it within two asterisks. So it's just parsing it all within the interface here. So now I made the text bold. So to recap, what I wanted from my ebook so far was something that could work in the browser, mobile responsive, built-in audiobooks, 
uh, a markup language to make it easier to write, and a parser that had a graphical interface. But there was one more thing that I knew I wanted from my eBooks, and that was that they would respect the freedom of the reader and the writer. Best eBook on the planet should be an ethical one. So what would be required for an ethical eBook? Well, to my mind, there's three parts to that. Now, the first is that it can be read and shared anonymously. Second is that it can be read offline, uh, which I think is a requirement for the first part. And then finally, that any software used by the eBook be released with a free software license. I'm sure everyone at the conference is familiar with the four freedoms, but I think it's always worth going over them again. First one is to use the software for any purpose. The second is the freedom to study the software, make changes to it. Third is the freedom to share the software with others. And fourth, the freedom to share changes you make to the software with others. So any good free software license will um, recognize these four freedoms. Now, why am I doing this? Why is a freedom respecting ebook, an ethical ebook, so important? Well, I think a good introduction to that uh, was the Free Software Foundation's pamphlet, The Danger of Ebooks. Uh, if I could quickly summarize the arguments of this uh, pamphlet, uh, let's consider the freedoms that you would get with a bound book, with a physical book. You can pay for it anonymously with cash. You can read it in private. You can share it with whoever you please. Now, the typical ebook for something like Kindle or on Apple's platforms uh, is much more restricted. By a Kindle ebook, you have to give Amazon your credit card number and your home address. If you want to loan a Kindle ebook to someone, you have to give Amazon that person's information. And perhaps most disturbingly, Amazon can choose to reach into your device and remove any ebooks on it you purchased or make changes to, what, to your library. Amazon famously did this back in 2009 when they went into customers' Kindle devices and deleted copies of a novel. The novel in question was 1984. And I actually have a more personal example of this. So last year I was in a book club with some people and one of us was listening to the audiobook edition from Audible. Uh, when this person was driving, the audiobook just stopped working. It completely locked up. When this person got back home, they saw that the audiobook on their phone had been replaced with a newer edition that tied into a new miniseries adaptation that was happening. So Audible had reached into their phone and made changes to their library. Now, Amazon is by no means uh, the only culprit here. Before 2019, Microsoft ran an ebook platform through their store. When Microsoft closed the platform, they deleted all the ebooks purchased on the platform from their customers' devices. Any notes the customers made in those ebooks were lost as well. Although, to be fair, Microsoft offered everyone a $25 compensation. You don't have to take my word for it on these things either. Uh, I found this very interesting quote from the Denver Public Library's blog. When a consumer pays money in order to access an ebook, that consumer is not buying that ebook. Transaction is more accurately described as paying for a license to access the book. The consumer never owns the ebook and the seller ultimately retains control of it, even when the consumer downloads it to their device. And speaking of libraries, they have it even worse. Amazon will not sell ebooks to libraries. And the publishers that do, such as Macmillan, will put big stipulations on them. The sales of physical books uh, like this are bound by something called the first sale doctrine says that the customer has the right to share it or to resell it as they please. With ebooks, since the publisher is merely offering access to the book and not ownership, the first sale doctrine does not apply. Libraries have to pay inflated licensing fees to publishers year after year to retain access to ebooks. Uh, libraries in the same network very often will loan physical books to each other 
but they're barred from sharing ebooks. And this is the norm for modern ebooks and audiobooks that you read them by the permission of the publisher. This is the fundamental issue for me. If you cannot read an ebook or share an ebook on your own terms, are you really the owner? My main point is that the freedom to read requires ethical ebooks. Unfortunately, the freedom to read is also is facing not merely a corporate threat, but a renewed political threat. Some people consider the freedom to read quite dangerous because you may read ideas that they don't like. Last year in Iowa, a school board candidate said that if he was elected, he would demand the library records uh, from his area to find students who had checked out books related to LGBTQ issues. In Idaho, there is proposed legislation to issue fines to librarians who suggest certain books to children. I'm sure you all heard that in Tennessee, the McNinn County School Board voted unanimously to ban the graphic novel Mouths from Schools on the grounds that a book about the Holocaust might offend with its profanity. I hope you see the common theme here, which is that very often uh, on our devices, we don't read alone. Rather, we can expect to find someone or something looking over our shoulder. Very often, we're reading by the publisher's permission. And things continue to go the way they are, the permission of the politician. Uh, now, in the novel for Fahrenheit 451, there's a section that I've never forgotten, where the old intellectual Faber tells Montague about the value of books in a culture that doesn't have time for them tells Montague that while movies and television reward the passive viewer and a surrender to the visual, with a book, the reader is in control. Power is in the reader's hands to consider the ideas contained within and to keep reading or to close the pages altogether. The reader has control over the ideas that are presented to them on the page. And that's the relationship with books that I want to defend. That special relationship between the book and the reader, which is not a privilege bestowed by a corporation or a state, but a human right. If readers are to be in control of their ebooks, the software of the ebook must also be transparent and accountable to the reader. That is why I think free software is essential to building the best ebooks. So now that I've covered the philosophical groundwork for an ethical ebook, let's go over what was involved in making one. So first off, uh, Nantucket ebooks is written in the shanty markup language. And if I'll go over here to my uh, parser editor here, um, you'll see at the top row there's a button that says help, and that will bring up on the right hand side some helpful texts. So here is the manual for shanty bring it up without having to go to a new page. And this is uh, all licensed under the new free documentation license. Help again, there's also an FAQ page that's also licensed under the GFDL. So I think it's very important to start from a foundation of free documentation. As far as the eBooks go, um, Oh, the, there's also the parsing script and the Arrowhead interface. Those are licensed under the GPL version 3. For the ebooks, there's three parts to them. The first is an HTML document that controls the structure and the content of the book. Then there's a style sheet which controls its appearance and how it will respond to different resolutions and device orientations. And finally, there is a script called ahab.js which is a script for interact, all the interactive elements of the page. And that also uses uh, the GPL version 3. So to go to our Silas Marner book here, uh, the whole menu here, this is, what's, this is part of the interactive features. Use dark mode, for example, text resizing. If I wanted to take notes, that's also controlled. So this little notes icon here will append a text area to each one each paragraph, I should say. 
We'll save those for you. Hide that here. So that's the interactive features that are controlled by Ahab. And I call it that because it's sort of the captain of the ship. Uh, as far as being able to download them or, and read them anonymously, uh, all of the assets for an ebook are contained within a folder. So you would have a folder with all of the public domain books here, and this one will be Moby Dick. And within that folder, it accesses the, uh, the style sheet and the interactivity script. Everything is within that one folder. It's not, it's, you don't have all the ebooks pointing to the same style sheet and script as you'd typically find on in most websites. Uh, this is so that the reader can download the whole folder and within that download folder, the whole ebook just works. It also makes it easier for authors to self-host these ebooks because they just have to upload the whole folder to their website and they're done. They don't have to set up a whole file system. Now, how can I let readers know that my ebooks use free software? I decided, after looking around, I decided to use a tool that was developed uh, by the FSF called uh, GNU LibreJS. And what that is, is a browser extension that will check um, if the JavaScript on a page has a free software license associated with it before running it. So it doesn't run the JavaScript automatically. It'll check for that free software license first. And let me show you how that will work. So the first thing you do with uh, GNU LibreJS is, um, well, for my ebooks, I made a page on my site called Software Licenses. And on that page, I created a table element with the ID JS license labels one. And then within that table, uh, I put three cells in each row. The first one is a link to the source code. A, the second row cell will be a link to the license associated with that code. And the third will be a link to the code that the, uh, the site visitor is going to run, which is usually the minified version, which has been compressed down to save on bandwidth. I'll show you how that works in practice. But here I am in my ebook of The Monk. I'm going to go down to the very bottom. And at the very bottom, there's this uh, notice here. And there's a link here called Software License Page. And this link has the relationship attribute JS license. So what GNU LibreJS is going to do is look for a link, uh, an, an anchor element that has that relationship attribute. It's going to look through that link to the software license page. And so here's my table. On the left side is the source code. So I click on that, got the whole GPL license there. Then I've got a link to the license, GPL version 3. And then finally, I've got the link to the code that the, the reader is going to be using. And in this case, it's the source code since I'm still in beta testing for version 2. But anyway, I, that's a, so uh, actually I'm running this presentation in GNU IceCap, uh, a browser that really is very freedom respecting. So I'll show you, uh, if I click on, I got a green check mark here. That means all the source, all the scripts on the site are good. And if I ask for a report in a new tab, it'll show accepted scripts on the page. And it's got Ahab here. And it says it's running under a free license, GPL version three. And it was not too much work to get it set up on my site. You just have to make sure that all the links in the table are accurate, but it's a fairly straightforward process actually. And it's something that I thought was well worth it. To add one more thing for user freedom, um, uh, an additional measure of it, uh, reading a Nantucket ebook does not even strictly require JavaScript at all. If JavaScript is completely disabled on the page, you can still read the ebook uh, and audio files are still accessible. So if I go over here to my ebook for Silas Marner, uh, and let's say I'll go over to LibreJS, I'll completely blacklist the site. 
so it won't load any JavaScript. First thing you'll see is that the menu icon has disappeared, so that part won't load. Uh, however, it's added this new part here called audiobook contents because the audiobook player won't show up. It'll append this page to the table of contents, and I can click and just it'll play the audio file that way. And then if I whitelist it, reload, the menu icon is there again, and that page that part's disappeared. Uh, and that is accomplished by using no script elements for parts that I want to show up on the page if JavaScript has been disabled in the browser. So that's another thing you can do that really helps respect user freedom, that they at least can have a really good reading experience, uh, even if they've turned off JavaScript for extra security or to save on bandwidth. So I hope that I have shown in my talk that the goal of an ethical ebook one that respects the freedom of its readers and the authors who write the ebooks, while delivering a really great reading experience, is not only a worthy goal, but a very realizable one. And if you are interested in helping with Nantucket ebooks, uh, please consider becoming a writer for the platform. If you are interested in that or have any other questions or comments about the site, you may please email me at njb at nantucketebooks.com. And with that said, I uh, thank you all for your time. Happy to answer any questions here. So I'm not sure if Ian is still here. I can hear you, yes. Sure. That's getting saved to your browser's local storage. Yes. Um, the norm for ebooks on Kindle, for example, is that when you write a note uh, that's stored to Amazon servers and they can read any notes you take. Uh, what I've tried to do is something where the notes are saved to the reader's own device. Sure. Uh, so, yes, as far as uh, um, accessing the software, um, that would be on my site, nantucketebooks.com. Um, it is uh, all on the web. Uh, so I, I definitely should come up with a some system for downloading the interface for parsing it. Um, I guess that would be my next step. But right now it's all on the website. And... Uh, as far as supporting it, I uh, do have a uh, I do have a Patreon account. That would be Patreon.com/slash Nantucket eBooks, and I am also setting up a Libra Pay account as well. Looks like a lot of discussion. Oh, it looks like it looks like quite a bit of discussion, actually. In Saturn. Now I am in a WeChat here, so I will. Um, let me just, uh, 
Let's see here. Um, so Daniel Littlewood says, uh, one could imagine funding a free book with a Kickstarter type model, release it under a Creative Commons share alike once we get 10,000, but not before that. It's still a paywall of a kind, but it does respect all freedoms. I think that's a good point. I, um, that is definitely a financing model for books that are to be shared on a free basis is that you know you the the fundraising is on the front end it's not selling copies but raising money for it that's definitely something i'm working on with a few authors who are, have been interested in using the site goodness uh let's see here um uh, the if the uh, I'll ask if there's any questions. Um, let's see here. Yes. Yeah, uh, before this question goes away, I should answer. Um, so uh, Verlix in the chat says, is EPUB not a good free software format? Um, so EPUB is uh, an, an open standard. And uh, so that's for reading on, a, on an e-reader, on a special device. Or there are free software programs like Calibre, where you can have a library of EPUB books. And uh, that's a that's a great format for if you're reading on an, a device. I know some people do like the e-ink displays of, of e-readers. Um, my issue is that it's very difficult to read one of those online, and I was really trying to focus on a browser-based e-reading experience. Um, I know that standard e-books is a platform, and everything they release is EPUB, um, and mm -hmm. They have very good quality control, uh, but again, you need a special device or a special application to read them. I think, particularly for authors who are wanting to really share their eBooks, it, there's something very powerful in just being able to send a link to someone. There's my eBook. They can just open it up in the browser. Um, Al Gott says, "Superb talk and great info. Thank you very much." Um, okay, here's a couple more questions. Um, what is his opinion in response to the question that if books can be loaned off, loaned out, then no one will buy them and the author will starve? Uh, I know that's something that a lot of uh, people ask. I don't agree with that at all. I can think of many. Um, well, let's, um, I would put this to the free software. You know, you have ebooks that are released under a, a free license, but people still support it financially. I think that's definitely the case. Um, and here's another one uh, from G Goes. How can we convince more authors to not use the ebook publishing platforms like Amazon? Um, so, I think definitely showing people the alternatives that you don't have to go through Amazon. And a lot of authors I've talked to, they're very frustrated with the process of going through KDP. So I think it's important to show people that there are alternatives. I think a lot of people stick with KDP 
as they don't know that other options are available. Um, let's see any other questions here. Um, could, uh, so ZLeap says, could there be NextCloud integration? I think there definitely could be, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that further. Um, is there a Mastodon contact point? Uh, MNW asks. Yes, that's a good question. I will go back to my first slide here. So uh, if anyone's watching the stream still, um, who's in the chat, my Mastodon account is at nantucketebooks.fostodon.org. FOSS is in free and open source software. Oh, and Ian, uh, we were talking about uh, books earlier. I had to show you I have my copy of Free is in Freedom that I, uh, I, I printed out and bound myself. myself muted when I was asking you questions earlier. Well, muted for everybody oh, sorry. else. So they couldn't hear me, right. unfortunately, but they heard the important thing, your, your answers at least. Um, oh, that's great. That's great that you printed out. I was like, oh, is that an early copy? Uh, because <laughs> it doesn't look like uh, quite like ours. <laughs> but that's great. Um, yeah, this is a great, it's a, I highly recommend the book for those who haven't read it yet. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, what was I going to say? Um, ooh, okay, let's keep looking through. They, you keep getting more questions, so I'm going to keep looking. I had one, and I just forgot it. So let's let's keep looking to the IRC. Uh, here's another question from GNU2. Uh, how does it work with archiving or libraries? Uh, that's an excellent... So as far as libraries go, I think that it would be very, you know, because li this is a real issue for libraries, is that the ebooks that they have access to, for the most part, have an enormous amount of DRM uh, that comes with them. And, and it, it's this strange thing where uh, ebooks at libraries have hold lists. And you'd think, how could that be possible? You know, an ebook should be more useful, it should be easier to share. Um, and instead, they use DRM to make them less useful in some respects. Uh, I think it would be very, you know, it's something I'd be interested in talking to a library about is um, having a, a list of maybe 100 or 200 really, you know, important ebooks that would be in the public domain that um, they could add it to their library catalog and people just click the link and they can read it that way. I think that would be very useful way. Or it could have a zip folder where people could download the ebook. Uh, and let's see. The question. Um, um, is there any next cloud integration? Yes, as I said, I'd be happy to talk with that. Uh, and MNW also asks, how are the books licensed? Um, so right now, I have a number of public domain ebooks on the site, so there's no license required on those. Um, and generally beyond that, I would leave it up to the author. I do have an author who's using my site who uses a Creative Commons share-alike license, and I definitely encourage that for more ebooks. I plan to at least some of my fiction on the site under that license as well. Um, and then GNU2 uh, says to refine his question, can libraries get books through this platform somehow and lend them? How does it work in that case? And for archive, is there some kind of long-term archiving of the books? So, yes, um, Libraries could get, uh, you know, if you could, since, since everything's self-contained in one folder, uh, you could offer uh, zipped versions of ebooks and lend those out in some fashion. I th definitely think that's something I'd love to talk about with libraries. And I do plan to implement long-term archiving of the books as well.
Yes. I remembered my question. Uh, okay. The shanty markup language, have you ever thought of um, um, that it would be nice to have it be, uh, have an integration with Pandoc? Have you ever heard of Pandoc? Sorry, I've, I've, I'm a heard, I've heard the name. Oh, Can it, you tell me about sure. That? It's, so it's a software that um, converts between different markup languages. So you can take um, HTML input file, for example, or any other bunch of different type of link markup languages and say, give me a markdown out of it, and it'll try and convert it as best as possible. And it does a really good job. It's uh, pretty comprehensive, So they and they t generally like to, they don't really um, shy away from adding support for new languages, so I think it's something that would be worth looking into. Thank you for letting me know about that. That sounds very exciting. And I assume LaTeX is one of the options? Yes, definitely. I'll, it's, just, it's just spelled P-A-N-D-O-C. You can do a search for it. You'll... OK. Thank you for letting me know about that. Pandoc. Yep. Let's see. Let's look back to the IRC. Excited that it's sparks some good discussion. So N MNW says, I'm asking about the Nantucket eBooks. Are they li what license are they using? Uh, there is no universal license that I use for them. I do leave that up to the writers on the site. Um, some, you, as far as Shanty goes, um, I've actually found that it's quite versatile. So the presentation that I gave, um, I wrote that in Shanty. And then I had a, I wrote a parsing script that divides it into the different slides. So everything you see there was, is in a text file on my server, and then it's getting parsed on the client side uh, into the different slides, and it links up with the different images. So I've found I've been able to use it for presentations. I do blogging with it. Um, it's proven to have a lot of versatility. Well, wonder. Um, I'm not. We're we're in the last minute of your talk, and I'm not seeing okay. any more questions. So I would just mostly just want to thank you and say, uh, I think the project is wonderful, and uh, it's a great contribution to um, free software and to the commons. So um, thank you very much.